Hey everybody, it's the Drive to School Podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman and joining me today again is my friend, the apologist David Zills. How you doing, man? I'm doing all right. Excited to get some time off around Christmas. I've been looking forward to this for way too long. Yeah, I, I'm actually kind of excited about that myself. Uh, as, uh, I, I get to be the, the content executive of Higher Things, which means uh, I'm not actually serving an altar. I'm going to sit in the pews with my with my family this Christmas, and I'm kind of excited about that. Um, it, it's uh, I, I love the preaching. I, I love all of the, the the work that goes into the ministry, but at the same time, I haven't gotten to sit next to my my wife uh, for Christmas since uh, seminary, and so oh wow, yeah, this will yep. be a fun one. Um, yeah. Yeah, so so I, I know we're in Advent, I know we're in Advent, but we're looking forward to Christmas, and so let's talk a little bit about it. Um, what are the apologetics of, of Christmas? Yeah, so I think uh, that's a good question. I think uh, when I was wrestling with my questions, I mean, my skepticism and doubt, it was a long process, and the thing that I realized at some point was that Christmas really is a game changer for how we know whether God exists, first of all, and how we know what he's like. Um, so, yeah, I mean, without Christmas, there's kind of, there, there. I think there are three main ways we can try to know God, broadly speaking, and there's probably other ways to categorize it. But I think there's philosophy, um, mysticism, and prophecy, you know, to the extent that there are prophets who claim to be speaking for God. And I think those those can be helpful, but there's this sense that we're kind of just inferring about this God who's out there in the ether somewhere. And so there are all these concerns that can creep in, like, is this just my invisible friend? Or, you know, it's the the Wizard of Oz thing where, you know, there's this there's this powerful being that can take care of my deepest needs. But if we pull back the curtain, we'll realize it's all fake and none of it's real. And, you know, it's like Taylor Swift said, you're on your own, kid. You always have been. So um, I love it when you quote the hymnist to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, so, so I, I, I feel like there can be this angst to the extent that God is just kind of out there in the distance, and we have to try to come up with educated guesses about what He's like. And the the message of Christmas is that rather than us trying to get to God in terms of knowing Him, He revealed Himself to us. He made Himself known, like. Um, he pulled back the curtain, so to speak, and said, this is, this is who I am. Um, so I think that's really powerful. Absolutely. Um, and especially actually this time of year, uh, we, we, we lean into the feeling, uh, because life is, life is good, but when life is bad, it feels all the more lonely, uh, on Christmas when, when there is loss, when there is pain and suffering. And, and so the idea that God would feel far away when he's calling himself Emmanuel, which is God with us, the message of Christmas matters all the more. Yeah, so there there are a number of aspects to Christmas. There's obviously our salvation, the fact that God stepped into a human form to carry our sins. I think there's another aspect where he can relate to us. There's a compassion. God has lived the life that he that, that we've lived. He suffered a death that's far worse than any of us will have to. Um but then there's also this knowledge aspect where we can have all these questions about God and it can feel like we're kind of stabbing in the dark. But if God became a man, that means two things. Number one, it means Christianity is now a testable religion in ways that other religions aren't. So other religions could be based on like philosophy, where you kind of try to look at general human experience and things that we all kind of know and try to make inferences based on things we see about the God we don't see. And so, you know, Confucianism, Buddhism, they could be in this category. You know, atheism would be in this category. The inference is that there is no God um, in that case. And I think, uh, you know, I think there are useful things. I mean, you can make a case for God based on things like philosophy. And I would put science as a branch under philosophy. Science was once called natural philosophy, so the philosophy of nature. But you can make these kinds of arguments from general human experience. You know, there seems to be the appearance of design in nature. It looks like the universe had a beginning and therefore a first cause. You know, there seems to be a moral law written on everyone's heart, which seems to imply that there's a moral law giver. And we can make these arguments, but they're all inferences. We never actually come into contact with the God we're inferring about. And so 
you know, we can wonder, did we make the right inferences? What happens when other people say, well, I made an inference and there is no God. I look at the suffering in the world and clearly there can't be a God who, who, who lets all this stuff happen. Um, and there, there are other religions based on mysticism. So instead of kind of looking out at everything we see to infer about the God we don't see, we look inside of ourselves and we try to kind of find the divine spark within or see if God could communicate with us in our soul. And um, I think there's legitimate stuff that happens this way, but there's problems too, because how do I know it's not just in my head? You know, I can imagine myself into all sorts of experiences. Um, on the other hand, maybe it is genuine. And we've talked about what if there are deceiving spirits? You know, how do I know that the so that if there is a supernatural source for my mystical experience, how do I know it's good and that it's honest and that it's really telling me something true to the extent it's telling me anything and not just a feeling? Um, and then the other the other way is through prophets, um, people who say, I have a message from God. God spoke to me and he wants me to tell the world this. Um, so Islam falls in this category, Mormonism, you know, Joseph Smith, Muhammad. Um, the problem is there are lots of prophets who are all saying different things about God. And so how do you know which one is true? So then you have to test the prophets and that can get um, tricky. So I, I think there are ways of knowing things about God, but the Christmas hypothesis that God became a man is really a game changer. It, it changes it from speculation about a God out there to a person in history that real people interacted with and we can test their claims to see if they stand up to the science of historiography and we can see you know what what really makes sense absolutely and so because we have a, a god who is born who is in incarnate who is made flesh in in time and space uh it, it our lord subjects himself to history in this case then right yeah yeah so he's a he's a person of history which means the way we know about him primarily is through historical methods. And it may seem that, you know, science is way more, gives way more certainty than historical knowledge. Cause you know, you've heard histor history is written by the winners and, you know, witnesses are notoriously unreliable and all these kinds of things that seem to say, you know, we can't have confident knowledge of God through historical means. Um, but, you know, I have a friend who actually once kind of said this, and as I talked to him kind of through the way historians actually apply sort of a scientific method to actually test witnesses, they don't just say, well, so-and-so wrote this down in the year 300 AD, therefore it's true. They test it like you would in a court of law, and they'd say, is this a reliable witness? And then if we can, from reliable witness, ascertain certain facts about Jesus, then the next step is how do we explain those facts? And it turns out, I will claim, and that we'll get into this more in the new year, that any alternative explanation for the facts about Jesus doesn't fit all the facts. It fits some of them, but other facts contradict it. The only hypothesis, the only explanation that fits the data we have based on reliable witnesses is that the New Testament was right about Jesus and that he really is the Son of God. And if that's the case, then when we want to know who God is, we just have to look at a person and we have to see what did he say? What did he do? What did he care about? And it's it's very concrete. It's very like, maybe I like it because I'm an engineer, but it's not this abstract God of the in the ether, but it's a, an actual person that I can relate to. And I can see how he interacted with people and how he cared about people and how he was very wise. And that's, you know, that's very comforting to me because it kind of it takes away the Wizard of Oz angst that if I pull behind the curtain, it's all a sham. You know, God pulled behind the curtain and subjected himself to scrutiny. And um, the Christian hypothesis stands the test. And so in Jesus of Nazareth, we actually have a portrait of who God is in human form. Right. And in a lot of ways, this sort of um, this robs one of the attacks on God uh, of a lot of its power. There's this this old saying about you know the three blind men who who grab hold of an elephant and and uh, the the first man says well the elephant is uh, it, it's kind of thin and uh, it, it's flexible. It almost feels like a snake because he's grabbing the the trunk. And the second one says well this this elephant is like a tree because he's grabbing one of the legs. And and the third one grabs it by the tail and, and says it, it feels like a like like a like a broom. Um and and so we we when we interact with God, none of us will ever really get the full picture of who He is because 
was. Um, he, he's just so much bigger than us. And we are, we are like blind men trying to grab hold of him. But that's, that's how a lot of religions work if you have to interact with God only through the second person. So somebody who interacted with him is telling you their experience. Okay, I, I understand that that might be a, a limited scope and, and sphere of, of what or who God is. But we have a God who actually takes flesh and interacts with us directly. He, he actually, he, he limits himself so that we can, we can comprehend and witness the, the fullness of his mercy, the fullness of his glory, the fullness of, of, of his power and, and chiefly of his love. Yeah, I think, well, one thing about the blind men and the elephant, the person who's telling that story is claiming to be the one person in the story who's not blind. So <laughs> that's a good point too. So, so that claim is kind of claiming a higher level of knowledge than it says is even possible. It says it knows enough about God to say that none of us has the whole picture. It's like, well, how do you know that? You know, so it's kind of, it's claiming to know more than we, than it says it actually ca we can know. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, there is this sense that we're all blind men groping in the dark for God. And if God reveals himself, if he takes the initiative it shows um, that God cares about us. And one thing that we don't talk about a lot in the church is that God cares for us intellectually. We talk a lot about how he cares for our hearts, our emotions, our need for forgiveness, our souls, but we don't talk about how he cares for us intellectually. And part of how God's wired us is, you know, I was at Thomas Aquinas that said, just as the appetite of the stomach is for food, the appetite of the mind is for truth. And that's how God wired us. He gave us our reason to want to know truth. And he's not going to give us that and then say, you know, okay. apply that to uh, apply that to everything else. But in your relationship with me, you got to be confused and in the dark and unsure. No, 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 that's not God. He, he takes the initiative in revealing himself so we can have confidence about who he is so he can put to rest our doubts because he's a loving God who wants us to feel um, reassured that we can trust him and that he's real. And I think that's that was one of the coolest things when I was really struggling and I read um, the chapters in Isaiah numbering in like the 40s, like I think especially chapter 43, where God says, I am God, there is no other. I have saved and proclaimed and revealed that you may know and understand that I am he. So he says, I have revealed, he's not hiding and he says, so you can understand, not be confused, not be unsure, but know with confidence that he is the real God, not any of these other gods that were claiming to be around at the time. And I think, you know, that's very reassuring that God cares about our doubt. He cares about our desire to have confidence that what we believe is true. And part of the message of Christmas is that um, God reveals himself in very concrete ways so we can touch him. You know, I think, you know, John sums it up well in his first chapter of his gospel, which is a great passage on the mystery of the incarnation around Christmas, where John's had decades to reflect on Jesus and sums it up very succinctly. And one of the things he said is, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, meaning Jesus, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. And, you know, in John's later epistles, his letters, he says, you know, what we have seen and touched and interacted with very concretely, this is what we proclaim to you. And so um, it's kind of mind boggling that God would kind of become one of us and move into the neighborhood. But it's 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 really profound and it's really comforting because it means not only does God care about our emotional needs, our spiritual needs for forgiveness and reconciliation with him, but he cares about our intellectual needs and our desire to know the truth about him. And he's made himself known. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, I got nothing. Uh, David, uh, any, any more closing thoughts on, on sort of Christmas apologetics? No, no. I think in the new year, we'll have to get into some of the details about how do we go about explaining the historical data about Jesus and how can we rule out all the alternative explanations one by one to show that the New Testament story is really the right story about Jesus. I can't wait. That'll, that'll be a lot of fun. David, thanks so much for joining us and, uh, and Merry Christmas. Sounds good. Merry Christmas. Awesome. That was really cool.